Hello and welcome to the spectacular gardens of Stow in Buckinghamshire, where we've gathered together eight prodigiously talented landscape artists. And as well as their paints and brushes, they brought with them draft excluders, irons, kettles, tea strainers, hair dryers, whisks, everything but the kitchen sink. Welcome to Iron Monger, no, sorry, welcome to Sky Arts Landscape Artist of the Year. Today, eight new artists have travelled from all over Britain and Ireland to put their artistic skills to the test. Whether they're rolling ink, scraping paint or stretching wool, it's the judges they need to impress. Art historian Kate Bryan, independent curator Kathleen Soriano and award-winning artist Taishan Schierenberg. I think, as a painter, <laughs> there's plenty here there for is. them to get their teeth into. Really? all for the chance of winning a £10,000 commission to paint a view made famous by Turner, Petworth House. And the painting will become part of the National Trust's permanent collection. It's like it's got a witch's cauldron and he just is there staring at it and staring. But they're not the only artists hoping to catch the judge's eye. Fifty more have also descended on Stowe to try their luck as wild cards. The trees are fabulous, I think. Thank you. Do you want to buy it? So with just four hours to make their mark... Try not to snag my poncho. <laughs> Who will claim today's place in the semi-final? I feel the monks could have used this in the medieval oh. monasteries. What a gorgeous gadget. Competing in today's heat are seven professional artists. Nicky Heenan, John Rogers, Nal McCarthy, Tom Yendel, Moy Mackay, John Maxwell Steele, and Peter York. The preparation I've done has varied from dreadful to okay, I'm happy with it. I do make pieces of work that are absolutely terrible, so I'm worried about doing one of those. Joining them is just one amateur artist, Richard Allen. The only practice that I've been doing is. Uh, the occasional views out of my kitchen window. So anything that's not framed by French windows, I'm a little bit um, nervous about tackling. Before the challenge begins, the judges get a chance to see the submission landscapes up close and personal for the first time. The three esteemed judges, the wall, it's the perfect combination. So let us begin. I like this one. Great big, moody, broody sky. I'm in that landscape now. Mm. I think that it looks deceptively easy to paint a picture like this because it's abstract, because the paint's roughly put on. But to work out how to get that kind of flat, dark, kind of lead grey into the sky and have it evoke rain clouds. I do genuinely feel that they know what they're doing. It's English landscape in a filthy day and it really comes across fantastically. I think it's such a clever way of introducing their landscape painting to us. It's like they're giving us a photograph of what they've created, but instead of using a camera, they've painted it. Mm, sorry, sorry, I finally realised we're actually looking at the landscape within the painting. Yeah. And my yes. eyes are resting on the surface of yeah. the painting mm. and not going in. What I understand it is these are photograph postcards. So we ah. took photographs, made them postcards, they're leaning up and then it was painted like a still life. And now you say it, I'm even more impressed because if I were in the studio, I would expect that picture to be about that high. Exactly, yeah. me too, me too. This is a lovely, felty, woolly thing, not a painty mm. thing. I probably would normally be very wary of something like this as just being completely crafty and not really occupying a strong enough position in a sort of fine art arena, which obviously shows a level of snobbery. But I, I think it's really successful. I like the mark making, I like the inventiveness. I mean, the mixture of uh, threads in the sky to get that sunset and the detailing in the flowers mm. and, the, and the bubbling in the stream is extraordinary. I love the colour palette of this, these really diesel-like blues playing around and then flashes of this almost like peachy colour. The longer we stand here, the more I get the sense of this mass of water mm. and the greyness of it and the shiny bits of it on its surface and it really is moving. I, I think they've got that very well, the atmosphere. Mm. 
The gardens of Stowe in Buckinghamshire were designed in the 18th century by architect William Kent and further developed by the famous landscape gardener Capability Brown. Created as a series of pleasing vistas, the gardens are full of architectural follies, two of which our artists are facing today, the Gothic Temple and the Palladian Bridge. While most of the competitors prepare to recreate the view in just one painting, one artist is hedging his bets. I'll be working on all three canvas boards at the same time, more or less. One of them will have more of a balance and it will please my eye, and I know that's the one that I should put forward. So it's just a matter of numbers, really. They should get one out of the three. John Maxwell Steele is a professional artist from Solihull in the West Midlands. His submission painting shows a view of the fields from his studio window. He uses industrial paint, applying it with an object he bought from a hardware store. That's in the bottom of the door to keep the draft out. There was more use painting than keeping the draft out, so she used these to move the paint around. They are beginning to come to the end of their life now, they need replacing, but I thought I'd stick with them one more time. <laughs> Colour is a bit dull today, but I just use my imagination, I think. Can't wait. I just want to get going, warm up a bit. <laughs> Artists, I hope you're feeling inspired because your challenge is about to begin. May your muse be with you and your time starts now. For some artists, picking which scene to paint can be easier said than done. Every view, when you frame it, um, is quite tempting. The main problem is choosing something that has sufficient interest to sustain me. Richard Allen studied a degree in fine art before becoming a full-time illustrator, but he's recently picked up a paintbrush again as a hobby. His submission is of Compton Abbas in Dorset, not far from his hometown of Bournemouth. Richard, I'd stop now. I like it. <laughs> Are you a trees and grass man, or do you like a bit of human structure? I've composed it so that the bridge feature isn't in it. But that's not like sort of drawing mittens on people when you can't draw fingers. It's No. It's, um... That's a good tip for the people at home. <laughs> so there will be no man-made structures in this at all? They won't, no. There's no obligation to go for um, architecture. I love the idea that these beautiful things have been placed here by people like Capability Brown, and you thought, well, oh, I don't just... fancy that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one artist really does fancy the look of these historic surroundings. My painting's pretty much about the cedar of Lebanon because that was planted in 1745 when Capability Brown was here, you know, probably standing in a place where he stood, thinking, I'm going to plant a tree there. <laughs> Professional artist Nikki Heenan grew up in New Zealand but now lives in Malmesbury in Wiltshire. Her submission painting is made with oil paints, wax and pigment and shows the sea and pier at Aberystwyth in Wales. I'm mainly an outdoor painter. I don't like painting from photographs. I like that feeling of being cold, or I like the feeling of being hot, because it puts something extra into your work. You need to feel it and, and take it down to a deeper level. A famous mouth painter once said that art is in your heart and your head, and it doesn't really matter with what part of your anatomy you paint with. It's the time that is difficult for me, trying to do something quickly, with silk painting especially. Tom Yendel is a professional artist living in Hampshire. Tom was born with no arms due to the drug thalidomide and paints using his mouth and his feet. His submission was painted in acrylics by foot and shows an imagined bluebell woodland scene. Tom, uh... You've got a pretty detailed drawing on the go there. Mm. Tell me, how does the drawing fit into your process? I do the drawing first, and then I put this behind the silk, so the silk 
is the main thing. Oh, it's going underneath that, is it? Oh, yeah, so yeah. the transparency, you can see yeah, the so you, composition. Yeah. So this is just about making the marks. Yeah. Like the problem when you're painting with your mouth is when you paint, you hold the brush your, or the pen in one place yeah. and you look with your eyes. Mm. Right? Ah. So you, you only see one. Right, so your yeah. one vision's going to be limited when you switch to yeah, working but when with your you, mouth. When you paint with your mouth, you look up here mm. and then you paint down here mm. and it's a different perspective so you need to so get the by doing this silk. i can hopefully get the image right yeah. before i put it onto the yeah. onto the silk that's the idea our eight competitors aren't the only ones painting here at stowe today we've invited up to 50 other artists of all ages techniques and abilities to take part as wild cards and unleash their creativity I have to have music in my head before I can scribble. This is definitely swing music. Dum dum da 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 dum dum da 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 dum dum. If one of them impresses the judges, they could find themselves competing in the semi-final. But why, given all the vistas around here, have you chosen to do the mowing of the lawn? Well, it's patterns, you see, isn't it? I love the idea of the inks getting blotted onto it. I just think that's really satisfying. Apparently Andy Warhol used to do it as well. I like to experiment. I've got watercolour, bathing salt, silk threads and blowtorch. It should leave a nice sort of like brambles come... Yeah. Is that a sponge? It's an old sock. <laughs> an old sock. It's an oh, old sauce. Sauce. <laughs> I'll let the paint do its own work, see what happens. It's a, it's a bit of a voyage of discovery, really. Do you share your umbrella when it rains? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Competing for a definite place in the semi-final, our eight heat artists have been working on their landscapes for almost an hour. I'm feeling that I need to sort of make a move, actually, and sort of start the more technical parts of the painting, you know, how I want the building to look and the reflections and things like that. With silk, you can get some real disasters. <laughs> so I'm just going to have to take my time with the line and think about the colour later. Already they've got a really good feel to them. There'll be people all over Britain ripping the bottoms off their doors when they see this. <laughs> An hour into the competition here at Stowe, our eight artists are etching, sketching and painting their landscapes. But there's also a technique we've never seen before, felting. So is this your original method? Well, felt making isn't, you know, it's the oldest form of fabric making known to man, so that's not, not no, mine. No, OK, you're not climbing but that. But I try to develop it in a more painterly way. I wanted to make people think that it's a painting. Moy Mackay is a professional textile artist from the Scottish borders. Her submission is a view of her hometown of Peebles and is made by blending and matting together merino wool fibres, a technique she calls felted painting. Can I actually have a go? Yes. So you hold that, that hand and you're going opposite directions and you're brushing them away. Like that? Yep. These are actually dog brushes. Are they really? Yeah. So what have I just done with this? What um, have I achieved? <laughs> Nothing. I've moved some wool well, about what you've... on a couple of dog yeah. brushes. <laughs> then you take it off. And oh, OK. You have to do it a few times. Yeah. You know. Just imagine if it <laughs> yeah. was there like that. Uh -huh. As you say, it needs a bit more yes. dog brush. We all do. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> well, just, a, just a tad. <laughs> The bridge is the star of the show. 
it's wonderfully twee, or could possibly be. Um, so I'm, I'll try and make it a little bit more than it is. Add a little bit of graphicness to it. John Rogers is a professional artist from Sidcup in Kent, who spent his working life in the design and advertising industry. His submission painting is a composite image of views of Greenwich Reach on the River Thames. Here you're drawing onto tracing paper, so yes. what's the technique you're going to... I draw in pencil, mm. in tracing paper, accurately. Once I'm happy with that and I've composed the image, I'll transfer yeah. it onto the, the board. You chose this uh, wood surface because of the equivalence of... Uh... Yeah, this beautiful honeyed stone mm. that's everywhere. So I'm planning to use the tone of this. Yeah. So well, I'll, put, I'll put the shadows in, I'll put the highlights on, but the body colour, which would, yeah. I would normally paint... Well, that's interesting, because it gives it a bit of breathing space. Yeah, yeah. and it gives it texture. Yeah. Yeah. It gives it movement. Ty, I'm a bit worried about this one. It's almost like you've asked them to paint something slightly in between the landscapes, if you know what I mean. Oh, go on. Well, you've got that fantastic bridge, but it's a bit off for them over here somewhere. The church on the top is obscured mainly by trees. I mean, what you've asked them <laughs> to paint is a big green hill. I can see your point, but I think, as a painter, <laughs> there's plenty here there for is. them to get their I teeth into. Really? I think you do one swish with a four-inch brush across the yeah. canvas and you've basically got this. What? <laughs> one artist foregoing paintbrush and canvas entirely has engraved his drawing of the landscape onto plastic as the first stage in his printmaking process. Right, I've just applied the ink with a piece of card, which you force the ink down into actually all the marks that you've made on there, and then wipe it off with a bit of old telephone book. This is just to see what the uh, first marks I put on there look like. Peter York is a professional artist from Sheffield specialising in printmaking. His submission of the Derbyshire countryside was made by dry point etching a printmaking technique that he's also using today. We've got that over the top there. OK. As you can see, it's quite messy. There, it's fun, though, isn't it? What a gorgeous yes. gadget. I feel the monks could have used this in the medieval well, monasteries, printing out the Bible. Illuminating manuscripts and things like that. Lovely, it's emerging. It, oh. So you can start seeing the different marks I'm working with. There'll be all sorts of things You're happening with it. going to put on colour here? Oh, yeah. They'll be smudged in, they'll be wiped in. So you have the same image, but it could be that it's stormy, it could be blue skies, it could be sunset. You're in control of the weather. I can make it up. Terrific. Yes. <laughs> I'd usually work, it's like cleaning a window, I'd turn the top left corner work across and then down, and just going back and forth. Sort of like typewriting, I suppose, or cleaning a window, yeah. yeah. Irish artist Niall McCarthy has been painting professionally for five years since giving up his previous career as an archaeologist. His submission is a hyper-realist painting of waves breaking on Gary Vaux Beach in Cork. But today, he's hoping to impress with a surprising new technique. This is completely different. Yeah, very it's... different. I want to get across a sort of a rush effect. Okay. That's, um, I'm... It's speed. You want yeah, movement, speed. movement in the exactly. landscape. I can see that. Yeah. Why is this sense of speed and energy so important to you in a landscape here, which is actually very solid and staid and there isn't much movement at all? I think it's just, for me, summer is a very transient season, perhaps the most, and just like all this is going to be soon turning to to rot, really, in a so couple of weeks. So soon, so <laughs> soon. Meanwhile, the wildcard artists are expressing their creative talents. I love this. 
The trees, like, in particular, yeah, are, are fabulous, I think. Thank you. Do you want to buy it? Um, well, maybe we can talk later. I want to put the odd duck on the water. Why don't you go swan? Well, you know, I never thought of that. There's swans around. If you're going to buy it, you might as well have what you want. And if you want a swan, you'll have a swan. OK. Oh, you're also looking over to the right-hand side. Yes, yes it's more a of a theme of today. That's right, people, people are going for that, and they're ignoring that one. I can say I love it, but I'm loath to say that. Every time I say I like it, the price goes up a bit. There's a lot of grass up to this huge country pile, which is very symmetrical. It could automatically just look really cheesy, but I think there are people who have found really interesting compositions. There's a guy just over here who's doing this really modernist painting. I like what he's doing. It's a substantial piece of painting. Um, have you seen the woman who's got the big green umbrella who's making the black and white ink work? Mm, she's used those lawn mm, lower patterns very beautifully to lead you through the painting. I'm just going to mention this. There's a lot of goose excrement and um, flies. So there are sort of a few things they're having to fight with and they're doing pretty well. There are key stages in all our artists' work and Tom's reached the crucial point of transferring his pencil sketch onto his silk canvas. How lovely it is. I'm now, so... this is the most meticulous drawing. Yeah, and now I'm just about to use my mouth to trace and use the thing called gutta to make the line. It's a sort of rubber, isn't it? Yeah, it's like wax. If you just drop ink on the silk, it will bleed to the edge of the silk. So you have to form, like, little reservoirs for the paints to go into. Also working in fabric, Moy's giving a woollen landscape a bit of a soak. I've covered it with a mesh and put soap and hot water on it. And what that does is it mats the fibres together. At this point, it takes on a bit of a life on, of its own. And hopefully when you peel it back, it's a nice surprise. <laughs> it's nearly halfway through the competition. And to mark the occasion, the heavens have well and truly opened. Oh, dear. But it's not necessarily bad news. The rain is kind of simplified some elements on the painting, so it, it can help with the process. The rain puts a veil on everything in the landscapes. Plus, you can't see. That's always a plus, because it's your, it's your mind that ruins your work. The rain's good. There's lots of flies in mine as well. We should all add to the organic feel to it. <laughs> Battling the great British weather here at Stowe in Buckinghamshire, our eight contestants are halfway through their landscape challenge. In just under two hours, the judges will have to choose a winner. So how do they think the competition's going so far? The rains have come. Mm. How does it affect the day? When it's raining, you hope the sky is going to be a bit lively, but even the sky is a bit of a, a flat grey. Mm. So it's, it's difficult. I think they've done quite well with what they've got because they've had to use elements from the landscape rather than use light and shade. It'll work very well for John because he actually painted <laughs> yeah. and then he washed it all away. I've seen his three pictures come to life, almost look finished, and then somehow two seconds later, it's back where it was before. It's about getting the sense of the landscape through mixing and melding all those colours together. It seems like a quite a perverse technique. It's like it's got a witch's cauldron that he just is there stirring it and stirring it, waiting for the magic to happen. But what about Richard? I just love the way he puts paint on, and in the subtlety of Tony's creating distance, um, what we loved about his submission, of course, was the, the conceptual idea of taking a landscape and reproducing it as a still life. And he hasn't played with those ideas, and I wonder, is it going to be special enough? What about Nikki? At the moment, I don't like it as much as I like her submission. It feels like what she's doing at the moment is a bit clunky in comparison. I don't know that that, that colour palette and that composition are doing anything particularly interesting, but it might just be that it's so unfinished. 
OK, Moy, how's the wool going? It's not an easy thing to do outdoors. I mean, I didn't really comprehend how she made it, but there's all this wet and dry process that she's got to go through. Well, the washing is the way of meshing it together, together rather yeah. like, it's you the know, blending. you put a sweater in the washing machine and it gets all fibrous. That's what she's trying to do with the exactly. washing. I mean, there's obviously a huge degree of skill and experience in knowing mm. if she puts that there when she washes and rolls it it's going to create that effect which you know really can't be underestimated that level of skill i've rinsed the soap out of the felty painting so now i'm going to just put it in the spinner to hopefully get it as dry as we possibly can But unfortunately for Tom, keeping his silk painting dry isn't quite as easy. Well, it's run a bit in the... Run a bit. But you know what? <laughs> it's not an unpleasant effect, is it, do you think? Oh, you yeah. hate it. I have to be polite, don't I? With silk, no matter how much ink you put on it, it's not going to change the effect, really. Maybe this is a happy accident. The lush, unbridled gardens, the woodlands and rivers running through Stow look as if they've always been here. But appearances can be deceptive. Stow is a completely fake garden. It's a naturalistic, picturesque-looking informal landscape, but it's completely contrived and created by lots and lots of people. The gardens we see now at Stow were created by Lord Cobham, who inherited the estate in 1697. At the time, the fashion was for the formal French parterres, influenced by the grand gardens of Versailles. However, Cobham's vision was to create a new kind of natural-looking garden. He wasn't afraid of just losing the landscape that was there and starting again on his idea of creating what was the beginnings of the English landscape movement. Enabling this new informal landscape was the latest technological invention, the ha-ha. It's a very clever feature that sinks a retaining wall into the landscape so that your sheep or your cows cannot enter your garden. But looking out, you've got an uninterrupted view that almost joins your garden into the wider countryside. In 1741, Lord Cobham entrusted the grounds into the hands of his head gardener, Capability Brown. He implemented and developed Cobham's vision, creating a seemingly natural, but in fact entirely man-made pastoral paradise of elegant sweeping valleys, expansive lakes and gentle woodland. This style of landscaping not only made Capability Brown's reputation, but also set the template for the archetypal English style of garden. I think Stowe is the most influential landscape garden possibly in Europe. So it's a, a product that the English invented and this model of a garden that's completely different to anything that went before it. Nearly 300 years after their creation, the gardens of Stowe endure as if made by nature herself. Suffering for their art in the day's downpour are our intrepid wildcard artists. As the judges don their most stylish outerwear, they have to decide which of today's 50 wildcards is the winner, and it's not easy. I really like the guy over there with the kind of big mod dark modernist painting. The deep purples. Yeah, yeah with the, the light, light coming yeah. through. Yeah, like that was really pretty. Did um, you see the lady with the ink? I like the that. ink is fantastic. I really like that one. I like the, the width, the, the it's composition. It's ambitious. Yeah, yeah, and the idea of closeness, which she's got the trees on the right and the, and the temple on the left, up the, of the, of the building on the left. No, she's got... That's and great. she's been ambitious, you know, to work with ink on that scale is really, really good. A lot of people working big. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Myself and my wonderful fellow judges have all decided that we'd really like you to be the wild card today. Wow. Thank you. Well <laughs> Portsmouth-based artist Kim Whitby will now enter a pool of wild card winners, from which one will be selected by the judges to take part in the semi-final. <laughs> It's not just materials and equipment our artists bring with them. 
Friends and family are often part of the kit too. Peter, so you're a Richards dad? That's right, yeah. Well, when did you realise you'd got a, an artistic talent in the family? I think when he was about uh, two, uh, two. He started to draw then, and quite well. And he's had a pencil in his hand ever since. I don't think I'd give a two-year-old a pointy old pencil, but you took the risk and it's paid off. That's right, yes. Well, what he's done is he's painted quite an accurate representation of the landscape, which we don't get very often. It's quite a novelty <laughs> approach on this show. <laughs> I'm interested to know whether you remain an optimist and whether that one inch of blue sky is going to remain. <laughs> it's there to stay. OK. Yeah. How do you know when to stop? Um, well, fundamentally, when it's all blocked in. Is there one part, for example, that you're just absolutely not going to touch in the last half an hour because you don't want to disrupt what you've already done? There's, there's nothing that I'm particularly precious about. Right. So, so you'll let it keep evolving right up until the last minute? Yeah. OK. Today, our artists are using a range of tools to create different effects and textures. But Nikki likes to incorporate Mother Nature. I often take my watercolours and I just chuck them, or I'm going to chuck it. Right, now this has got grass, it's got stuff. It makes it more interesting. It stops the human hand being the controlling thing. You know, nature's the, the, the force, isn't it? Not humans. The artists have just 30 minutes left to complete their landscapes. At the moment I'm needle felting, which is how I add finer detail and a bit of shading. I think it's going okay. The fabric's so damp, but it's not looking uh, disastrous. Put a bit of darker colour on it, we might bring it up a bit. It's always been a balance between the tree and the building, but I want the tree to win. OK. I'm just getting to the point where I'm hoping I can start playing with it by putting some colour and more uh, different effects onto it. I knew this was a challenge. A bit longer, another couple of days would have probably helped, but there you go. <laughs> As far as time goes, it may well be that I'm sort of tinkering. I think that I'm on schedule. I don't know temp fate. Here in the stately gardens of Stowe in Buckinghamshire, our eight artists are in the very last moments of their landscape challenge. It's very subtle. It is very subtle. Yeah. It looks like light hitting the pillars, yeah. doesn't it? The off-white cotton. Yeah. Try not to snag my poncho. <laughs> I don't want to be incorporated into your art. <laughs> I'm reasonably happy. Working wet in wet will allow me to maybe sort of tie things together with final brush strokes that bring the whole into, into one. Tired around the eyes now, yeah, and sore in the feet, yeah. So, good, it's nearly over. Artist, you have just five minutes left. I'm really just putting the final touches on as much as I possibly can. Not worry about little tiny bits of it, but how, how's the whole thing working as a composition? So I suppose the big question is, which is the one? I'm still undecided. Uh, one of the two end ones, okay. possibly. Artists, your four hours are up. 
Please stop what you are doing and step away from your work. It's the judges who make the final decision on the day's winner, but before their deliberations, some art-loving onlookers share their thoughts. That's really nice, isn't it? Yes. It's nice and light. A lot of things today have been rather dark with the gloom and the weather. I like what he's done with the sky. Yeah, beautiful colours, yeah. I actually walk my dogs every day here, okay. and that's a really unusual perspective because it actually looks like, you know, something's moving as if, like, a train's sort of going past. To help the judges select today's winning artist, they first reduced the eight artworks to a short list of three. It's a pity that Tom lost out against the rain a bit. I think he was a bit concerned that it started to fall into sort of batik style. But actually, I thought it was much closer to Italian marbling or something. Mm. I loved his formality, the way in which he approached the bridge, front and centre, that was the hero. Yeah. Yeah. I still think it's got a great mood to it. What will I take away today? Um, not to paint in the wet and not to do silk outside, I think. I really like this. It's one of those brilliant moments in this competition where someone has really taken the time to plan everything through and then allows it to all come together in the final hour, and it's exactly what she's done. The colours through it are beautiful, and as it goes towards the bridge, you get those bits of pink that, you know, yeah. are reflections of the bridge. I think overall it's yeah. nice and balanced. No, no, I like it. I wouldn't say that the piece is the best painting I've ever painted. However, the piece is raw and expresses the emotions and the, the weather conditions of the day, and that I find quite exciting. I think it's a painting of great dynamism. At no point did he respond to the landscape. Mm. I think the paintings, the three of them, took over. And he yeah. was responding to what was happening on the painting, which is yeah. no bad thing. I think it gives the, the, the actual structure and the composition and the, and the surface great vitality. But um, I thought we wanted our artists to respond a bit to the landscape. I mean, what it does as an abstracted image is that the more time you spend with it, the more you start to impose a view on it. Yeah. So you can suddenly see a tree over there or a figure in the left-hand yeah. side. But who knows? <laughs> Miserable, filthy weather, it sort of helped. It's sort of like a dappling effect on the sky and the foreground, which I was quite pleased with. I just love the thickness of the paint, the way it's put on. It's thick enough so you can see the directions of the marks, mm. how they lead you across the structure of the tree. And each tree has its own personality. I love that tree at the back. It's fantastic. I find it a little bit muddy. A, no. a little bit uninteresting. No. Um, but, you know, he did actually get a good sense of the place today. I don't think that there's anything that I could have necessarily done differently. My main concern was just about framing the composition right. Maybe the sweep that I took in was a bit sort of general. Well, who would have thought the most painterly thing <laughs> yeah. in the whole run today isn't paint at all? It's actually this fantastic felt. I love the light emanating from behind the hill and that the, the distance. I mean, mm. I can't believe she can get that much distance with wool. I just think it's great to have such a distinct medium and then also to have a really distinct aesthetic. You know, she creates this fantasy land. It's like mm. Tim Burton, slightly gothic, it's slightly uh, naive. It's a wonky, dark rendering of this landscape. There's always things you think, oh, I wish I'd done this or done that, but actually doing it outdoors in sort of all sorts of weather. So I think considering all that, I'm quite happy with the outcome. If I look at those three, I think it's a, a strong... That looks so good. I think that they're all doing something really different. Those two, I think, are fantastic. That's amazing. And that so second fair. one looks, looks so good. much better from a yeah. distance. After much deliberation, the judges pick their shortlisted three. And the first of those artists is... Nikki Heenan. <laughs> and the second is Richard Allen.
And the third artist to be shortlisted is Moy Mackay. Well done, everybody else. The standard's been enormously high. I'm not disappointed by the result. As long as I walked away and the work I produced I thought was of a good standard that I like, that was fine by me. Before they decide who will win a place in the semi-final, the judges take the opportunity to look at the work the shortlisted three have produced today alongside their submissions. Let's start with Moy. I much prefer what she did today to her submission. Mm. Yep. I think it's got more sophistication, it's got this kind of gothic noir element to it which works better. The abstract qualities of her natural form work really well. And then we come to the buildings and it doesn't quite work, I don't think. I completely agree with you, but there are moments like that tree on the left-hand side, which is just tremendous. Yeah. She's a fantastic artist. There are reflective passages under the bridge. I don't even know how she's done it with yeah. the wool. It's quite nice to have the opportunity to speak out for wool and textiles as an art form. To Richard. We really got to explore the way that he painted today, the way he comes at things in an almost counterintuitive way. So he's building this tree, but he's using zigzag lines. It really does have a completeness about it. And that muddiness that we see in the foreground, I think is as much about giving us that sense of distance so that the foreground is almost a hazy blur mm. and, and the eye's focus is very sharply taken to the back. So I, mm. I think it's the way in which he's using the yeah. paint to describe perspective. There's plenty of things that, that can go wrong in a process like that, so just uh, grateful to make it through to the final three. Nikki's work the only one with a great seascape in the foreground. Mm. I was slightly surprised by such different treatment of water today. I think I expected that to be her style of treating water and to see the lake described in a similar way. The first one was made in the studio, and I wonder whether it was made from a photograph. Mm. Whereas what I think the painting lives off today is her struggle to find mm. the form and the textures in the landscape, and it makes it richer for that. I find this really difficult because We've got three really good artists really again. Good. I'm absolutely thrilled that I've got this far. I didn't think I would, but it's, it's, it's a lovely feeling. Moy, Richard, Nikki, congratulations on reaching the shortlist. But you know, when it's down to three, it's a really tough decision, and there can only be one winner. Yes, and that winner is... Richard Allen. Well done. Well done, well done. Oh, I love your stuff so much. It's more than I could have hoped for. It's great. I've texted my wife. I've texted my mother. My father needed no um, encouragement and, and stormed the stage. It was a really difficult decision today, but ultimately we picked Richard because we just fell in love with the way that he was able to manipulate paint and for it to be so expressive, but also so representational. It was unusual. It's actually quite subtle, and we're absolutely fascinated to see what he can do with that moving forward. It feels amazing. Um, I feel elated, but truly, truly tired. Next is the semi-final. <laughs>